This morning, U.S. intelligence officials are on alert, watching for possible revenge attacks for the death of bin Laden. Here to discuss that are senior correspondent John Miller, a former deputy director of national intelligence, also author and journalist Peter Berg, and his latest book is Manhunt, the 10-year search for bin Laden from 9-11 to Abbottabad. Welcome. So when you look at this uh, and this treasure trove of intelligence that supposedly was there, uh, what was it and, and how has it affected it? How has it benefited us? Well, the treasure trove, I was able to watch, uh, get a look at some of the declassified uh, material that hasn't been published yet, paints a picture of an organization under tremendous pressure from the American drone strikes. Uh, bin Laden was advocating that his group leave for a remote part of Afghanistan. He was telling one of his sons to leave Pakistan's tribal regions and go to the prosperous oil kingdom of Qatar, which is a, obviously a very safe place. Um, and so, you know, he was contemplating changing the name of the group. He was telling groups in, affiliated with al-Qaeda not to use the al-Qaeda name because it was bad for fundraising, to attract a lot of negative attention. Um, and it's a, it's a picture of an organization under pressure, in disarray, aware of its own failures. Bin Laden blue skying about attacks on President Obama, General Petraeus, some of his subordinates pushing back saying, wait a minute, you know, that's pretty complicated. Might be easier to attack American soldiers in Afghanistan. Have you learned anything about what happened when he was actually shot that you didn't know? Well, uh, one of the, I mean, what appears to be his last words was, was the words to his wife, don't turn on the light. Um, well, that wasn't necessary because somebody had taken the precaution of turning the electricity off in the area, which gave the U.S. Navy SEALs a large advantage on a moonless night. Essentially, when he was right. killed, so. he had nothing, you know, he couldn't see anything, he was very disorientated, uh, he basically was sort of paralyzed. And what about information might lead to Zawahiri? I don't think there's anything in the treasure trove that might lead to, lead to Zawahiri uh, that I'm aware of. Um, <clears throat> you know, eventually his number will come up, uh, but uh, these guys are pretty careful about their operational security. Like the courier somebody will give them the same kind of lead we have right. for Osama bin Laden. I was very curious, though. You had the opportunity to walk through uh, the house where bin Laden lived. I think a lot of people would be curious, is what was that like? You look at it from the outside, it looks like this potentially luxurious compound. What was it? What was in there? You know, it was a rather squalid suburban compound. You know, bin Laden didn't die, you know, in a sort of spectacular martyrdom. He died surrounded by his kids in a suburban house with, you know, very, each wife had their own kitchens. Each wife had their own kind of setup. Um, they were not living large. You know, their beds were made from hammered together pieces of plywood. Uh, in bin Laden's bedroom where he was killed, there was a, a little box of Just for Men, Pakistani version, which he would use to dye his hair. His toilet was this tiny little closet-like uh, uh, thing that he would have to squat over. It was not the sort of, you know, lair of Dr. No, Dr. Evil. But the, the, the dyeing hair thing, this wasn't part of a disguise. This was for the propaganda videos to appear. Sure, and he was living with his much younger 29-year-old wife. He was 54. He had two other wives. One was 64 and one was uh, 54 living in the compound. He had two kids with her when he was living in Abtabad. You know, I think he probably wanted to look good for the, you know, his younger wife. But you, you talk about the videos, too, and you, you both interviewed him, so you both had that opportunity to sit down and speak with this man. What was he like? Because we hear so much about how he wanted to maintain control and how Zawahi just doesn't have the following that he had. And there clearly was something about him that brought people in. So, I mean, the difference that you cite is, is pretty dead on. I mean, you talked to Osama bin Laden, you had to lean in to listen. He was very low-key, soft-spoken. Um, he spoke at length. He tried to mix in history and religion and, and, um, and examples and metaphors, whereas Zawahiri, who spoke perfect English, I mean, he was much more kind of the fist-shaking zealot who yelled into the camera. Uh, stark differences, I would say. Yeah, I mean, my, uh, John met both guys. Uh, I only met uh, Osama bin Laden. Um, you know, my overall impression of him is very low key uh, and very well informed. You know, he was not a sort of, I expected some sort of table thumping revolutionary. He wasn't that. What, what's, what happens now? I mean, where does Al Qaeda stand now? There's this new German report out this morning about another group of documents that sort of gives us some insight into what they may have been planning. And I think that's a fascinating set of documents there because that's very operational stuff. You know, if anything, bin Laden was a little bit isolated from that. But I mean, here you have the plans of Rashid Rauf, right. who was the mastermind of that British planes plot you remember from 2006 to blow up a dozen planes, um, talking about the chemicals, talking about the strategy and the recruiting. So that's going to be very valuable. But it still signals, I think, Peter, the idea that yeah, that Al Qaeda Central running a large complex 9-11 uh, operation is pretty much a thing of the past. They are counting on the internet propaganda 
and the lone wolves to kind of come together and do it for them in large measure. Where might it come from? I mean, a lone wolf can come from anywhere. I mean, there's a good news. There's a good news component of that. Lone wolves are just not that capable. I mean, uh, you know, we had a classic lone wolf at uh, Fort Hood, Texas. For Major Nadal Hassan, he killed 13 people individually. Each of those deaths, obviously, a tragedy. But this is not a, you know, strategic attack mm -hmm. on the United States or anything close. John Miller, Peter Bergen, nice to have you both here at the table Thanks, this morning. Peter. Thank Thanks, you. John. Thank you very much.